Howdy, I'm Andy Baker. I'm president of Andy Mark. Everyone is six feet away here, so I'm gonna take off my mask so you can hear what I'm saying and understand. We're gonna talk about self-inspection of your FRC robot. I've been inspecting a robot since the year 2000. During that time, I think I've come close to inspecting about a thousand robots. Uh, robots in Hawaii, Mexico, Canada, all across the US. I've been inspected in Turkey and Israel. I enjoy working with the robots and also especially the teams that built the robots. First goal is you wanna be safe. You don't want to get shocked. You don't want to get your fingers pinched, things like that. Secondly, you don't want to break parts, fry electrical parts or um, parts to, to snap off and, you know, break, it's a cost savings to have a properly inspected robot. When you are successful as a team, you're going to have other teams look at your robot. They're going to say, how'd you do that? That's pretty cool. You want to show them um, the fact, you want your kids and your team members to show them the aspects of your robot that they're proud of. The best tool to use when you go through a robot self-inspection is the robot checklist. This is really a summary of all of the FRC robot rules. We usually start with robot weight and size. Without your battery and without your bumpers, your robot weight has to be less than 125 pounds. I would shoot for even a pound underweight. Weight goes first usually when you do an inspection because if you're overweight, everything else kind of has to wait <laughs> until you get that thing fixed. This year, if you do have a second configuration, like a, a different arm, all of those configurations have to together be underneath 125 pounds. Second thing we always measure is the frame perimeter. Usually we have a, a fabric like or like a cloth tape measure that we string around the robot. If I don't have that, I can measure, not including the fasteners, 27 and an eighth, 32 and a half. I'm confident this is less than 120. Again, you don't wanna be over. That's a big deal to make a change. Your screws and bolts, they protrude outside of the frame perimeter. That is limited to a quarter inch. So look for the, the screws and bolts and bearings to come out of the frame perimeter. Now there is a rule this year, rule R4. During the match, if something starts inside and comes out, it has to be within 12 inches. If this thing had an arm that came out, make sure it's underneath 12 inches. My advice is to be well under that 12 inches. Another thing would be the height of the robot. That changes every year. This year's robot height has to be under 45 inches. That's rule R3. Obviously this guy is well under 45 inches. Next are bumpers. The first one, each segment of your bumper has to be at least six inches from the corner out. So obviously this is longer than six inches, and so is this. Bumper segments cannot extend more than one inch past the hard bumper backing material. This metal is the hard bumper backing material, not the wood. If the metal is only four inches long, but the bumper is six inches long, then that two inches is too much. The bumper length has to be within one inch of the backing material. What else? If there's a wheel here and a wheel there, there might be a gap in your frame. That gap can be bridged by the bumper, but the gap has to be less than eight inches. Also, when you mount your bumpers on the robot, the gap between the bumper edge and the robot frame has to be less than one quarter inch. The corners of the bumpers have to have foam involved. You can't just have a noodle stop here or stop here and stop there. If I hit this with my fist, I cannot hit wood at all. The bumper can either be vertical like this, like mitered like this bumper is, or they can be wrapped around, but have noodles in the corner. You've got to use pool noodles and they have to be positioned in a horizontal manner. They're stacked together, one on top of the other. They need to be two and a half inch nominal size. Keep in mind, pool noodles are not manufactured to a very tight tolerance. They're used to play in pools. The backing of the bumper has to be three quarter inch thick by five inch wide solid wood. Doesn't have to be plywood, but needs to be solid wood. The material of the bumper needs to be a durable fabric. On the bumper material, you need to have numbers. The numbers stick on there or they're sewn on there. They have to be at least four inches tall and it shows your team number. It's on all four sides. On this side, on this side, on the other side, on this side, on this side, on the other side, and the back. The bumpers need to be securely mounted to the robot. As an inspector, I'm gonna grab your bumpers. I'm gonna kind of shake them a little bit. 
I want the bumpers to be securely mounted. It doesn't mean they're put on by just cable tie or hook and loop. They need to be securely mounted to the robot frame. When your robot is on the floor, the, the top of the bumper can't be higher than seven and a half inches for this year. The bottom of the bumper can actually touch the floor this year. There doesn't have to be a gap. Okay, enough about bumpers. <laughs> Next, we're gonna talk about mechanical parts of your robot. At events, you would show your bill of material to your inspector at this point, but for the 2021 season, First has graciously given us a break of filling out the bill of materials. Woo! Sharp edges, when I do these inspections, I, I start touching the robot and I feel for sharp edges. And I actually feel two right here, so they're gonna have to file this edge in order to be legal. The reason why is we don't wanna get them cut, we don't want blood to be all over the place, we don't get students hurt or mentors hurt. Also, you can't have lasers higher than class one or horns or sounds that are distractions to your opponents. If you have springs or stored energy in your robot, I would inspect those. All of your springs and cables are securely mounted to good anchor points. Maybe there's a pin, like a pre-flight lockout pin that you have to pull before the match starts because you want this to be a safe robot. You don't want to have strings or cables or loops or nets that are on your robot to to entangle or damage another robot. Especially if it's outside of your robot, we will make you put cable ties to make sure those things aren't entanglement hazards. Anything that touches the field or carpet especially can't damage the field or the carpet. Rivets on your treads on your wheels or maybe an anchor point. On this robot, there's just a big old tread here. Usually it's, it's metal cleats that are not legal or rivets or spikes. Those are a big no-no with regard to contacting the carpet. Let's talk electronics, electrical parts. Your electrical parts cannot be modified. You can't be adding mounting holes or filing down surfaces to make sure they weigh less. With the exception, of course, you can strip wires and cut wires to make sure they're the right length. Your battery, it can be a 17 to 18 amp hour battery. It has to have this battery connector right here, and it has to have at least six gauge wire or larger wire. All of your batteries have to have insulated terminals so we can't see metal. So let's talk about the PDP, power distribution panel. On this robot, we've got power coming in here, snap action breakers right here, and then we have power coming out of these Wago connectors. You wanna have this thing visible and easily maintainable. Pull out these breakers from time to time. You might wanna reconnect a wire. So don't bury this thing underneath everything on your robot. The main breaker is over here, Brett. This is the 120 amp breaker. This is your main on off switch. It needs to be accessible. And it needs to be this kind and this style of breaker. It has a, a cable coming out of it that connects to your battery cable. The breakers have to be this style of resettable snap action breakers. This is a 40 amp breaker. There's 30 amps and 20 amps. This is our legal radio for this year. Radio needs to be the open mesh radio. It, you can mount it anywhere on your robot. I would recommend mounting it somewhere kind of high and not in a box of aluminum. You're gonna to need to take it on and off your robot to get it reprogrammed at each event. You don't wanna bury it down in the bottom of your robot. CAN bus wiring. CAN bus is this green and yellow wire. is mandated from the PDP to the RoboRio, but also many teams use CAN bus from each one of their speed controllers in a loop between their Rio and their PDP. The RoboRio is situated over here. That's the only robot controller that you can use. It has to be powered a certain way. Power input is right here and it comes from, I forget, it comes out of this end of the PDP. Wire size is a key thing. The 40 amp breakers have 12 gauge wire. The 30 amp breakers have 14 gauge wire. 20 amp breakers have 18 gauge wire. Most teams use red for positive and black for negative, but there's other colors here too, white, brown, yellow. Make sure you're following the wire color rules stated in R55. You can only have one wire per each slot. You can't put like two black wires into one Wago slot. Another thing is you can't have aluminum wires on your robot. They can be single strand or they can be multiple strands, but they have to be copper wires. So we've got motors here. We've got sim motors, we've got mini sims all kinds of motors, follow the rule R27. You can't just go grab any motor off of the shelf that 
might be a legal motor from years past. Each motor has to be controlled by a relay switch or a speed controller. For the larger motors, you can only have one speed controller per motor. For the smaller motors, and there's a list of them, they can be controlled, maybe one speed controller can control two of those motors. You can have custom circuits on your robot, but the custom circuits cannot be controlling motors or relays or actuators or servos. If you have pneumatics on your robot, you have to have the pneumatic control module. It doesn't happen as much now as it used to, but you have to do a continuity test on your robot. Electrical system needs to be isolated from the frame. The robot side of the 120 amp breaker, poke that post there and then poke the frame and that doesn't beep either. So I'm making sure that the frame is not connected electrically to the electrical system. Don't modify your pneumatics. You can't, you can't drill a hole in your cylinder. You can't cut off your rod end. The only thing you can do is you can take, there's sometimes there's pins in the end of the pneumatic cylinder. You can press those out and you can cut your tubing. Speaking of cutting tubing, it's not an inspection thing, but I'm giving you some advice. When you cut your tubing, if you don't cut it straight, you're gonna cause a leak. Get yourself one of these fancy little tubing cutters and it makes a, a pretty straight cut. Back to the inspection. You can only have one compressor is underneath 1.1 CFM or cubic feet per minute. It's a legal compressor. The flow rate is the, is the key thing. If it's, if it's a huge compressor with a flow rate higher than 1.1 CFM, not legal. Power. Um, this one's actually not legal. This cable here is the compressor power. It needs to go into the pneumatic control module. The compressor has to have some sort of a pressure switch that signals the electrical system that the pressure is at 120 or higher, so it shuts off the compressor. So you have to have a dump valve, turn the knob, and it dumps the air pressure out of your system. You also have to have tubing that's at the most approximately 0.16 ID and a quarter inch OD. You can have a smaller tubing, but you can't have bigger tubing. There's different gauges on the robot. One of them needs to show that the, that the stored air needs to be 120 PSI or less. And the other one needs to be after the regulator that shows 60 PSI or less. The pressure rating for all the pneumatic components on the high side have to have 125 PSI rating. Every component that's on the downstream side of the regulator has to have a pressure rating of 70 PSI or higher. All of your pneumatics are controlled by these, these valves. This is a double solenoid valve. The air would come in here and come out here. The biggest valve you can have on your FRC robot is limited by the fitting size on your body of your valve. Eighth inch NPT or smaller, then it's legal. These valves have to be wired into the pneumatic control module. So we talked about mechanical, electrical, and pneumatic. The final part of the test is to turn on your robot, make sure your pneumatic system is running correctly, make sure your versions are right on your driver station, and also make sure your robot turns off correctly. Also, you have to have a robot signal light. I don't think this robot has a robot signal light on it, so it would not pass inspection. When you do a pneumatic test, first of all, you, you get the pump to pump up and you make sure the, the high side gauge doesn't go higher than 120 PSI. The low side gauge needs to be 60 PSI or lower. If it's above 60 PSI, the team needs to change the regulator to make it right at 60 PSI or lower. Then you short these two leads here on, a, on your pressure switch to make sure pressure relief valve, which is right here, relieves properly. The pressure relief valve, by the way, has to be plumbed on a hard, not a flexible tube somewhere in the assembly near the compressor. So hopefully this video helps you become a good home robot inspector. It gets your team compliant with the rules and you're proud of your work. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, refer to your rules, first of all. If that doesn't help, maybe ask a senior member of your team or a mentor on another team or an inspector or a lead robot inspector. I hope to see you all at World Championships. Good luck and we'll see you at the competitions.